What a fitting song. If you will turn in your Bibles to John's Gospel, chapter 1. What a beautiful, beautiful song. Thank you, choir. Uh, John's Gospel, chapter 1. And you can also, while you find your place in John's Gospel, chapter 1, also flip to, and you may have heard this in the lyrics of the song, Isaiah chapter 40. And uh, so, because uh, uh, you'll, as, as I read, you'll hear that what, the, what our choir just sang is very much what we're going to read this morning. So that's, that's really neat uh, to have that done. Um, so John chapter 1 and Isaiah chapter 40. Let me read uh, beginning in verse 6. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. And then if you will, keep your finger there and to turn to Isaiah chapter 40. And we'll read down to verse 5. Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be lifted up and every mountain and hill be made low. The uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. You can go back to John. Let's pray together. Father, bless now your word, as it's, uh, it is the inspired word of God. And so we pray, Lord, that as the Thessalonians of old that we would receive it as it is indeed, the Word of God. Bless us now as we study, uh, study it, and uh, Lord, may we uh, have prepared in our hearts fertile ground for the Word of God to take seed and root, uh, that we might be obedient and bring glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Keep your finger, if you will, in Isaiah 40. We're going to go back and forth a little bit in this message uh, because... Uh, you, I think we'll see as we move through that there is a definite correlation uh, to John. I want to talk to you this morning about John the Baptist. John the Baptist. Uh, who was John the Baptist? How much do you know about John the Baptist? Have you given any thought to the significance of this man, this individual, John the Baptist? Is he of any significance in this age at all? Or is he just an Old Testament figure? What was his mission? Why was he sent? What was the significance of, his, of the timing of his ministry? Or was there any significance to the timing of his ministry? I ask you to think to the, with this morning with me about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is a much overlooked figure. Uh, maybe some of you this morning are thinking that. Well, you know, Scott, quite honestly, I haven't thought about John the Baptist in some time. <laughs> and if, if you're saying that, that's okay. I'm not surprised. Uh, it's, you don't hear much preaching about John the Baptist. And yet, we might say he was one of the greatest preachers. And so, uh, it would do us well to learn about John the Baptist. He's a much overlooked individual. He was the last of the Old Testament prophets. His ministry was transitional in nature. He was the forerunner of Christ. Therefore, his ministry increased or decreased in influence as Jesus' public ministry increased. Now think about that. Because that's probably the very reason why John the Baptist has so little place in our thoughts. It's that John 
by nature of his ministry, was a forerunner of Christ. And that it is said of John by his own lips, he must increase, referring to Jesus Christ, and I must decrease. And so there was a time in which John's, gospel, or John's message, and John as an individual, was a mammoth individual. He came preaching in the spirit of Elijah. And multitudes upon multitudes came pouring to hear him preach and came to be repent of their sins and be baptized by John the Baptist. So much so that it, took, it shook that whole region. And the Pharisees even sent representatives to John to find out who is this man out in the desert preaching who is this man that people are going to hear who does he claim to be what is his message he was shaking the ground if you will with his message and yet john the baptist his ministry began to slowly decrease the crowds slowly went away and where were they going they were going to hear another man, the Lord Jesus Christ. They were flocking to hear the one that John was telling about. They were going to hear the one that when he came to be baptized, John said, Lord, I have need to be baptized by you and, and you come to me? John said, I'm not worthy to unloose the latchet on his sandal and Jesus says suffer it to be so that all righteousness be fulfilled they were going to hear the one that when John said as Jesus walked by behold the Lamb of God that's who they were going to hear now so John begins to fade and the next thing you know Jesus ministry Multitudes upon multitudes were coming to hear him. And so it's so very easy for you and me to walk away and, and think not, not a whole lot about John. Maybe John was just, you know, he fulfilled his purpose. But I would say, and, and there's a reason why John the Baptist is mentioned in all four Gospels. John's ministry is prophesied about as we will see in Isaiah chapter 40 and in Malachi. So John was a mammoth individual. He is a person that any believer in Jesus Christ must come to grips with. He, you must understand who is this man and what was he preaching and what was his role because I think it, it influences a lot of our understanding of the gospel and of Jesus Christ, and how God was fulfilling his prophecies going into the New Testament. And so, John, the Bible says, was the voice of one crying in the wilderness. The Pharisees sent representatives, because they were too important to go, so they sent representatives to John the Baptist, and they said, and I'm paraphrasing, you can look these up in the parallel passages in Matthew and Mark and Luke, and, and, uh, but they went to John and they said, Who are you? Are you the Messiah? And he said, No. They said, Are you Elijah? And he said, No. Although Jesus said, If you will have it, John the Baptist is Elijah. So John knew the trickery that these guys were up to. So he didn't really answer them the way they wanted. He wasn't going to fall for their trap. But they said, are you the Messiah? Are you Elijah? Are you the prophet? He said, no, no, no. And they said, well, then who are you? And by what authority do you preach? And what authority do you baptize? We have to go tell those who sent us. And John, just like the Lord Jesus, 
so clever, has the right answer. He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight paths for the Lord. John knew exactly what to say to them. And in fact, when the Pharisees finally did show up to see him firsthand, he actually rebuked them and told them, you know, you vipers, why don't you repent of your sins and then I'll baptize you. You'll say later, is there any wonder what happened to John? You know, <laughs> but John didn't pull any punches. He was an Old Testament prophet and he was the end of the Old Testament prophets. He was the final prophet in a whole line of incredible men of God. And he stood, as Malachi said, at the edge of the Old Testament. In fact, actually on the other side of the end of the Old Testament. The Old Testament ended in Malachi. You had 400 years of what we call silence. It's not that God was always speaking. But in other words, when the Old Testament finished, there was 400 years where God spoke no more. He sent no more prophets. There was no more scripture written. There was a fade to black, a fade to silence for 400 years. Okay, America's not even 300 years old. Okay, that, that gives you any kind of, you know, comparison. For 400 years, longer than this nation has even been in existence, God did not speak except for through the written Word of God. And out of that silence, out of that darkness, a man stepped out, called by God, and began to say, Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. And he began to do it in the great synagogues and in the temple. Uh, no, he didn't. He did it with all the great royal robes and, and finery of the Pharisees. No, he didn't. He did it with all the great scholarly learning and, and all the prestigious uh, uh, excellence of the academy of Jewish life. No, he didn't. The Bible says he stepped out in the wilderness, the desert. And he had camel's hair and a leather belt. And he ate locusts and wild honey. He lived out in the wilderness and went and preached in the desert. And people came to hear him. Not exactly what you and I are thinking would happen. Not exactly as we look through this passage, you're going to see what does it mean to be uh, the forerunner of Christ you would not think that the forerunner of the king of kings would be a man dressed and behaving in such a way, and yet he is. This is John the Baptist, a forerunner, out in front of Christ. The first thing I want you to think about is as we think about him as a forerunner, out in front, there's many ways in which you and I are also forerunners of Christ. You say, well, Scott, I'm not a preacher. You know what? That's fine. I'm not a prophet. But we are called to be forerunners, to be out there heralding the coming of the king, preparing, telling people to prepare the way of the coming of the Lord, to get their hearts right with the Lord, to repent of their sins and believe in him. You say, well, Scott, is that a hard message? No, remember Isaiah 40? Comfort, comfort my people says their God. The worst thing you can ever do is that when God confronts you with your sins to think that God is being mean to you. The most compassionate, loving thing that God can do is reveal to you your sins and call you to Him for forgiveness. So don't turn away from Him. Don't recoil at the conviction of the Holy Spirit. Run to God 
and know that you are running into the arms of a God who loves you and wants to forgive you and give you everlasting life. So what about John? John, number one, was commissioned by God. Look in John, first, John chapter 1, verse 6. There was a man sent from God. He was sent from God. The Bible wants us to understand that very clearly. Now think about it. What if a man came like that today? He's out in the desert. He lives in the desert. It's kind of, you know, survivor man gone preacher or something. You know, he lives out in the, the wilderness, but he's preaching. He's not in the synagogue. He's not in the temple. He's not a Pharisee. He's not a Sadducee. He's not a lawyer in the sense of, you know, the, the Old Testament legal experts. Not, you know, in that sense, he's not a, study, a student of the law, a scribe, we might call them also. He's not one of those. Now, don't get me wrong. It's clear John the Baptist knew the Bible. <laughs> but what I mean is he has no official title, no official recognition from all of the religious structure of that day. That's what these guys were coming to find out. By what authority do you preach? By what authority are you baptizing? You see. But John the Apostle wants you and me to know there was a man sent by God. Sent by God. You know, John the Baptist, it was very important for him to, for, to him that others understood that he had not appointed himself and that he was not the Christ. John the Baptist was a man, not the Messiah. And understand, for that man to care that much about that question, he must have had an, an amazing impact going on in that culture. People literally said, are you the Messiah? Anybody ever ask you that? Anybody ever ask me that? <laughs> Think about it. Thousands of people were coming to him. And they were saying, are you the Messiah? Why? Because of the spiritual power the spiritual authority, the understanding of God's Word, the presence of God that was happening in his life. And people were flocking to hear this. And they knew God was with him. And so it sparked the question. And John said, No. No. I'm not that man. Because he went, he was before, he is before me because he was before me. You see, he's referring to Christ. He understands that. John knew that. Notice the contrast that John sets up in this passage. He says, John was a man sent by God. You see that part? But look in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Notice the contrast. Jesus was in the beginning with God because He is God. John the Baptist was sent by God. That's not a mistake. As we study through the book of John, you'll see over and over where John sets up this contrast. He'll say one thing this way, he'll say another thing that way, so that you and I see the comparison. He wants us to understand the comparison. He wants us to understand John the Baptist is amazing. John the Baptist did amazing things. John the Baptist was pivotal. He was transitional. He was the end of the Old Testament prophets. He was a fulfillment of prophecy. And he was not Jesus Christ. And he did not want anybody to believe that about him. So then what was he? He was a forerunner. Look with me there in Isaiah. Keep your finger here, but go back to Isaiah chapter 40. Let's read down uh, to 
verse 5. I'm sorry. Yeah. Verse 5, and we'll include 6. He says, Comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, that, he, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. A voice cries in the wilderness. The wilderness there, you know, we're from North Carolina, so the wilderness to us means trees, doesn't it? But in, in ancient uh, Middle Eastern, probably even today, it means the desert. It doesn't mean trees. So wilderness there is the desert, out in the middle of nowhere. So just, I always kind of like to throw that in there because I know when I was first reading the Bible, I used to think that. You know, I'm like, wilderness, and I'm thinking trees. There's no trees here. This is all desert. So the, uh, he, the uneven ground shall become level, and the rough places a plain. And the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. A voice cried, and I said, what shall I cry? And then he begins to talk about the message. What we might say was a little bit of the message of John the Baptist. John chapter 1. Well, actually, go to Malachi, last book in the Bible. Last verses in the Bible. Last book in the Old Testament. I'm sorry, not in the Bible. In the Old Testament. To the last verses. Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6. And you can cheat. You can go to the front of your Bible and get the page number. That's all right. Nothing wrong with that. I do it too sometimes. Verse 5, chapter 4. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. John chapter 1, verse 23. And he said, I am the voice of one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. That's who he says he is. That's who he says. He's one crying out in the wilderness. Make straight paths. So what's happening? What does that mean? One crying out in the wilderness. Make straight paths. Every mountain shall be brought low. Every valley shall be lifted up. You know, we hear that in Handel's Messiah. You know, what is that about? Well, in ancient times, many of the roads were not much more than pathways, as you can imagine. And so when the king of a, of a region uh, would announce that he's coming to one of his provinces, then word would be sent to that town and that province and that the king was coming and this is the route. And they would go and make sure that the road was cleared. So if there's holes, if there's dangerous places, anything, trees down, all of that, so that the way was made straight, the valleys were lifted up, and, and the hills were made low. Everything was cleared and made ready for the arrival of the king and his entourage. Spiritually speaking, John the Baptist was coming in the spirit of Elijah and he was pre preaching as a voice crying in the wilderness to the people of Israel, make preparations, the king is coming. Now, who's the king? Jesus. And how do you make preparations? Here's his message. Repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. You see, the truth is, in spiritual world, the mountains being made low is us coming off of our high horse of pride. And the humble shall be lifted up, Jesus says. The last shall be first, and the first shall be last. God honors the humble, and, and, he, and he puts down the proud. God is calling on those to repent and prepare because the Messiah is coming. Jesus is here. The King is coming. The Messiah that has been promised is on His way. This is John's message. John is saying, I'm here, and guess what? The King is here. Get ready. The King is here. Get your heart right. So naturally, His ministry would decrease as the King's ministry 
increased, you see. And so John's ministry was, it was very successful in reaching the people. He was experiencing God's power in an amazing way. And his ministry was also, at the same time, decreasing. In fact, some of his disciples were upset. They said, some of the people are leaving you and they're going to Jesus. And John said, he must increase and I must decrease. He was pivotal in history. In fact, in Matthew chapter 11, verses 11 through 15, this is what the scripture says. Truly, I say to you, among those born of women, there, are, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Yet the one who is least in the kingdom of, God, of heaven is greater than he. From the days of, of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. What is he saying? He's saying, folks, the time has come. All of these thousands of years of promising that a Savior would come, a King would come to deliver you from your sins and, get, and bring you the everlasting kingdom, and that promise would be heralded by Elijah the prophet, that's here. It's happened. And that man was John the Baptist. And you know what? That's true of you and me. Does it ever hit you? Do you ever have those, you know, like epiphany moments when you think, here we are doing our little daily things, grocery shopping and yard work and going to work and, and fixing the car and all of the kind of things that we all have to do, just normal, everyday things. But does it ever... Just You get a flash of spiritual light and you begin to realize all of this, this mediocrity is going on, but the King of glory came to this earth, was rejected, and was crucified, and put in a tomb, and rose again from the dead, and rolled a stone away, and was verified by miracles, and seen by over 500 people, and men stood and watched as he went back to heaven. And as he was going back to heaven, angels stood around him and said, Why do you stand here gazing? This same Jesus that you see being taken up from, heaven, from you to heaven will so come in like manner. Go! Sometimes we just need to be awakened. Because, beloved, we're no different than John the Baptist. The king has come. And there are men and women and boys and girls on their way to hell all over this world in every size and shape and color that need to know about Jesus Christ. We are the heralders of His coming. We carry on the ministry of John the Baptist in a very real way. God is calling you and me to go out into the wilderness of this world. If you're too comfortable in this world, if you love this society and this culture too much, if you do not feel at odds in this culture, then you are not walking as a forerunner. Every believer in Jesus Christ and holds this Bible and this book to be God's Word ought to feel a little bit estranged from what's going on out here. Ought to feel a lot like a pilgrim, a stranger, an outcast. Jesus said, don't be afraid. The world hated me before it hated you. Does the world love you? Do you love the world? John the Apostle said in his epistles, Love not the world, 
And literally in the Greek, it's what we call an imperative, a present imperative with a negative. And that literally means stop loving the world. Stop loving the world. Say, well, Scott, how do you know I love the world? Because we all came from it. We were all born into it. We were all lost at some point. Of course we love the world. It's all we knew. It's the transforming of our minds in Romans chapter 12, reading the Word of God. That's what begins to show us God's way. That's the wilderness out there. And you and I need to be voices crying out in the middle of the wilderness. Prepare the way of the Lord. Turn from these things while there's still time. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and be saved. Repent of your sins. Hear His message. Cast your soul and your life into His hands as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Turn your back on this God-forsaken world. Someday, His wrath will be poured out on it. And we don't want anybody to be uh, a part of that, do we? We want God kingdom to spread that was that's our calling that was his calling and lastly john was killed for being a witness don't think giving a faithful witness to the world is going to make them love you it's not going to happen it's not going to happen in fact in hebrews chapter 11 one of my favorite chapters in the bible it names off all these men who, were, who preached and were faithful and all the, one, all the horrible things that they suffered. Many of them killed, like John the Baptist. And it comes to the end and it says, Of whom this world was not worthy. Of whom this world was not worthy worthy you ever thought about that the people that God thought the most of in this world are the people this world thought the least of should it surprise us John the Baptist preached faithfully he decreased in ministry and eventually he was arrested and then eventually he was beheaded and lost his life trusting in Jesus Christ and believing and sharing the gospel. Now, most of us are not going to lose our life. But we might suffer some discomfort for preaching the gospel and sharing the love of Christ and the message of Christ with others. And you know what? He's worth it, isn't he? And many times those who are angry with you or with me for sharing the gospel with them do not understand that we are the ones who are loving their souls because we are willing to bear their wrath in order to give them the truth. Faithful are the wounds of a friend. You see, John preached the word. He was aware that he was not the light. Look in verse 8 of John chapter 1. He was not the light, but he came to bear witness about the light. He knew he wasn't the light. He didn't want anybody trusting in him. In fact, Jesus walked by at one point and spoke to two of John's disciples, and John's disciples left John and followed Jesus. John was okay with that because that was the point of his ministry, was to point people to Christ. And so John did that. You know, John MacArthur, uh, he said it this way. He was talking about, uh, you know, what was preaching for. Is it, you know, is it his opinions? People were asking him, John, what do you think about this? And what do you think about that? And there's value in that. You know, a man that loves God's word and fills his life with God's word and, and, and all of that, I would value his opinion. But I also appreciate John's response. John's response says, was this. As we witness to others, 
we need to have an accurate view of ourselves. We do not have all the answers. We are not the way. We are here to witness to the truth. John was a witness. He was a legal witness. The Bible says there in verse, uh, verse 6, I think it is. Uh, I'm sorry, verse 7. He says, he came as a witness to bear witness about the light. And this is John, uh, the Apostle John, who wrote John's gospel here, is saying from, from heavenly standpoint, John was the witness. Jesus claimed to be the light. I am the light of the world. And the Father gave, John, uh, gave Jesus a legal witness. John the Baptist spoke up and said, I am not the light. He is the light. You see. John was a witness. You and I are called to be witnesses. He is a witness to the merits of Jesus. Look in verse 15. He says, I got a new Bible, so I can't find the verses. Sorry about that. I love my new Bible, though, by the way. So, but, but I'm struggling finding my verses. He says, John bore witness about him, and he cried out, This was he of whom I said, he, was come, he who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. You see, he was a witness about the merits of Jesus, a witness about his own unim, uh, uh, unimportance. He, he was glad to say, I'm not the Messiah. A witness to the redemptive work of Jesus. He went on to say, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He understood Jesus was the Savior. Jesus was going to be the one to be sacrificed for our sins. John knew his own place. He understood his own place. And you and I must do that. And the church must do that. The church uh, does not exist to reflect the wisdom or the sophistication of this age. It exists to bear witness to the timeless truths of the Word of God. The church, the Bible says in the pastoral epistles, is the pillar and the ground of the truth. We exist as the church of Jesus Christ to be that voice crying out in the wilderness, make straight paths for the King. He is coming. Yes, He came the first time in humility, but brothers and sisters, He's coming again in great glory. And it will be a fearful time to stand before the King in that day if we do not know Him as Savior and Lord. For every eye shall see Him, the Bible says, and, this, and the heavens will be rolled back as a scroll, and every knee will bow, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You say, well, Scott, do you believe that? Do you believe that God is going to judge the lost like that? That He is going to send them into hell? Yes, the Bible says, and their smoke shall rise up forever and forever. And that means you and I must be voices in the wilderness. As painful and as hard as it might be, in this life, you and I must be those people who stand there as the church of Jesus Christ and say, turn, please, repent, please, come to the King. Please, God's Word is true. We are the pillar and ground of the truth. And if the church doesn't hold to it, beloved, nobody will. That's why we exist. That's why we exist. We exist to be that one institution other than the Christian home in the midst of the wilderness and the darkness and the depravity and the destruction and the sinfulness of this world. And we stand up and say there is a God and that God is holy and just and He will judge. But you know what? That God also is love. And that God wants to forgive you. He says He wants to comfort you. He wants to put you into His kingdom. He wants to share His mercy with you. Come to Him. And that's what the church says at the book of Revelation. Come. And the Spirit says come. And the bride says come. That's us. Come. Beloved, we have to be Voices in the wilderness. 
Christian, how are you doing? Are you being a voice? Are you seizing opportunities? Say, well, Scott, I'm not, I'm not a preacher. I'm not. You don't have to be a preacher. Be a witness. Just be a witness. Share about Christ. You don't have to get every word right. You just have to believe it yourself. Know the word enough to share it with somebody else. Are you doing that? Are you trying to do that? Are you praying over some people? Or is there someone God has laid on your heart? How are you doing in being a forerunner for Christ? How are we as a church doing at being a forerunner and a witness of the gospel of Jesus Christ to Lexington, to North Carolina, to America, to the world? You say, well, we're only one church. We can't win the world. No. But remember, what you shoot at, you, you'll hit. You know? <laughs> and if you aim at nothing, you'll, you're sure to hit it. But God wants you and me to do our part, whatever that is. You know, think of Gideon. Over and over, God uses a little means to do great things. It's we that stand back and say, but God, we're, we're, we, you know, we, we can't. We don't. God says, I can. I can. You just obey me. And I'll make your little into something big. We need to be. How are we doing it? Who will you announce Jesus to? How will we structure our ministries and services and campus to be witnesses of the gospel to our area? What are we doing? What are we going to do in the days ahead? What will we do to make sure that we're maximizing our witness for Jesus Christ in everything we do? Pray over that. You say, well, Scott, what do you want to do? I don't know. I'm not, I don't have a list here. I'm just saying, what does God want us to do? What will He want us to do as we move forward? Are we willing to do those things? To be faithful to the gospel so that we might be that witness for Jesus Christ. And then, I don't know who's here. This is a good sized group. I'm almost done. So bear with me a little bit longer. But, you know, in a group this size, do you know the king? I've talked a lot about the gospel here today and what the church ought to do. But maybe there's somebody here that you don't know Jesus. Maybe you haven't confessed your sins to him and called upon him for salvation. You know what? The great message to you is comfort. Comfort my people. Their warfare is over. Their sins are forgiven. You know what? Come to Jesus. He wants to forgive you of your sins. He loves you with an everlasting love. He wants you to come to know Him. You say, well, Scott, I don't know what to do. Well, you know what? You can come and I'll talk to you. I'll share with you. I'll pray with you. You can do it now. You can do it tomorrow. You can do it Tuesday. You can do it Wednesday. Don't put it off. Do it. But there's nothing magical about right now. But you need to do it. You need to do it today. You need to do it tomorrow. Don't put him off if he's calling you. Trust in him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. For your word. We thank you for our time together as a congregation. We pray, Lord, that you would do wonderful things among us. Father, we pray that you would help us as your people. We confess uh, our inability and sometimes even our fear to be witnesses for you. Uh, but, Father, I pray that you would anoint us with your power. Give us those opportunities, whether it be at lunch or uh, in conversation with family and friends or, or whenever. Just give us those opportunities to say a word for you. Give us the courage. Give us the words. Give us a heart for them. We ask it in Jesus' name.
Amen.